So welcome. Uh, again, I'm super thrilled for Professor Arthur Redding to be here um, to join us in our final lecture on Kazuo Ishiguro's Clara and the Sun, uh, a novel that really grabbed me. Um, I've read only um, his previous novel thoroughly before reading this book, and it was recommended by someone who is on my um, uh, PhD committee last summer. I read it right away and then reread it and reread it obsessively, trying to figure out uh, what is it about this book that really grasped me, um, especially in relation to our understanding of humanity and um, uh, not just intelligence, but emotional intelligence. So that is um, one of the uh, major themes that we've explored already. Um, Art, I'll recap a little bit of what we did in the past couple of weeks, just so that you know uh, what we've discussed. Um, and um, and then I'd like to just give uh, my concluding thoughts on the uh, novel um, for students to consider, especially because they're working on their final essays, which will be due at the end of the week. Um, so if there's anything maybe a little bit more useful that I can um, produce for you guys tonight. Uh, I'm still very much uh, working on my understanding of what Ishiguro was getting at with his um, interesting set of characters and a very small set of characters, which we've discussed before. Um, you know, that there's um, sometimes almost like a claustrophobic feeling in the book where, um, you know, the theme of loneliness gets explored through this uh, lack of community, right? Um, so we've we've explored that, but um, can you guys see, sorry, the screen, just double checking. This was from the previous week of lecture. Can you see it? Give me a thumbs up. Just so I know my share screen is working because it glitches sometimes, as we know. Thumbs up. Oh, okay, thank you, Sandra. Thank you, uh, Magda. Okay, um, <clears throat> so we talked about... Um, criticism of Ishiguro's work. We've read some um, reviews that helped us to see some maybe interesting gaps in what he depicts. And some critics have said in particular that um, it seems like uh, Ishiguro is not very interested in um, detailing finely the uh, world that he's depicting. Um, also in an interview that I shared with you, um, the author says, you know, I'm not even entirely sure if this book is set in the future or maybe in the past, but it's definitely in uh, North America, probably a, like a U.S. city. Um, so I'm curious to explore a little bit more uh, some of the ideas that we just touched upon um, right here uh, in the previous uh, meeting we had. So I'm going to start by just asking you, uh, instead of writing a paragraph like we did last time, um, to again recall that uh, Clara makes interesting observations in the uh, interaction meeting. The quote is uh, from page 66, if you have the physical copy. Coming down the staircase, I saw the hall was filled with strangers talking in humorous voices. Uh, these were the accompanying adults, all of them female. So as we've discussed, there's, um, and uh, Tegan, no, it's okay. No, you didn't miss much. <laughs> Welcome. Um, okay, so um, the observations here, she can register the tone of voice, which initially she finds um, positive, I suppose you can say in a very um, vague way, but then she reassesses the behavior of the adults um, and wonders if some of it is, a little bit uh, staged, contrived, or she senses something artificial about uh, the whole setup. Um, and then the second observation is about gender. She notices that all the parents are actually the moms and there are no males um, who accompany the children. So uh, I wanted to, again, point this out for us to consider what kind of ideas Ishiguro is presenting here with this, um, you know, dystopian kind of setting of lonely children and they're also very lonely parents. So we, uh, in general, meet very few male figures in the novel, um, I think. Um, Rick and Mr. Paul and Mr. Capaldi are the ones, you know, that we um, see as uh, 
the key players who change things, right? Who create some conflicts and some interesting, um, um, ask interesting questions about the meaning of being human or the meaning of recreating humans. So that's just to recap what we've been kind of working on um, last week. Now I'm gonna throw us into five to possibly 10 minutes um, of what I'm working on uh, in my personal um, journey of exploring why uh, science fiction like this matters uh, to humanity today. So the final lecture is called AI Aesthetics, Emotional Intelligence, Love. Um, and uh, again, uh, I recall what we did last week. So yay, that's there. Um, and then um, I'm going to go a little bit nerdy on you, just I swear for like two to three minutes and talk about Immanuel Kant's third critique. Uh, it, um, so just to introduce, uh, if you are not familiar with Kant, I think I just mentioned him briefly previously, but I just wanted to do justice to why I am uh, bringing this up. And so uh, uh, Immanuel Kant was an Enlightenment philosopher uh, who um, lived in the 18th century. Um, actually, interestingly, just as a pedantic side note, only lived in Königsberg or the former um, uh, Russian city, um, Kaliningrad. And um, he didn't travel at all, but he was a very routine man who wrote a lot and studied a lot and taught a lot. And so um, his contribution to philosophy uh, is grand in the sense that anyone who studies philosophy, you know, feels obliged to at least read a little bit of Kant and understand why he changed our ways of thinking to some extent. Um, and some people push back against Kant, right? So this is what I want to explore today through Clara and the Sun, though. So I'll give you the basics to for us to kind of have a uh, field day with Immanuel Kant in an interesting way for me, at least, I hope for you as well. So <clears throat> um, Kant was very interested in um, epistemology, which means how we understand, how we know things about the world and understand them. And he wanted to differentiate uh, empirical scientific study of things from belief, for example. And also another field that he impacted greatly is called aesthetics. Okay, so what's aesthetics? I'm going to explain that in a moment. But again, I want to stress that for Kant, experience or the noumenal in a fancy word, the real, you know, we talked about how science fiction likes to, you know, ground itself in real scientific evidence-based kind of um, uh, structures in order to explore the unknown, right? So um, the real is different for Kant from the super sensible. This is, I believe, something he coined as a concept. Um, what was super sensible is based on belief, um, you know, ghosts or something, uh, something that's not really knowable because we don't really have scientifically recorded experience of it. So the important super sensible examples for the book that we're studying um, are God, you know, is the sun a kind of God? Um, spirit or soul? Does Josie have a soul? Um, does Clara not have a soul, etc. Immortality would be related to that. You know, if you die, does your soul go somewhere, etc. If you want to study this further, you could just Google Stanford Encyclopedia Kant, specifically the third critique, and have a long, fun read on this if you're interested, if you're so minded. But so to go back to this notion that Clara can register um, emotions, she can understand when people are kind or unkind. Um, in the 18th century, there was this huge preoccupation, uh, thanks to Kant and a few other philosophers, actually there were some before Kant, who um, talked about the aesthetic. So I just, again, two more minutes of your time, I want to explain that uh, this term derives from the Greek uh, aesthesis, uh, sensory perception, um, uh, which relates to basically all of our senses you know we have five senses maybe some people believe in some kind of premonition so, uh, you know sort of a sixth sense um but one of the five senses is taste right 
you know, you, you taste something sweet or sour, or bitter, etc. Um, so taste became a, a bit of an obsession for some of the philosophers. Um, and I think that based on what I've studied so far, the concept of taste, not in the sense of I can taste something sweet, but taste as in, I think that this book has some beautiful ideas or i think this painting is really pleasing to me it has good um uh, maybe symmetry or maybe it has a good use of colors or etc right so taste um the idea is that the concept of taste was a kind of a pushback against just pure rationalism in the sense that we can judge okay um let's scientifically investigate why so many people find roses beautiful or why so many people think sunsets are um emotionally beautiful like somehow you know we love to look at sunsets and we love to look at roses why is this so universal right so um again this is just to bring us back to the point that the novel um asks us to think about whether ai is capable of that kind of sense of taste um, or a sense of beauty, or a sense of perhaps even more importantly, morality. Um, because for Kant, what I think puzzles a lot of scholars, um, uh, there's there's a connection between beauty and morality, or the um, uh, the ability to judge beauty seems to be connected with the ability to want good for society, to be a good citizen. Um, whose judgments are not necessarily impacted by this, you know, external uh, training that, well, there's a God above, and if you do bad things, the God will punish you. Kant didn't really want to buy into that kind of Christian model of thinking. He, he wanted to convince um, his, you know, students, his uh, readers that um, there's an inherent morality programmed in, in our, you know, in humanity and that uh, we don't need to fear god to be good moral human beings okay so these are some of the sort of heavyweight um questions that um, i think Yushiguru guru engages with in his novel so i'm going to stop and ask you now <clears throat> if we think about josie's portrait uh you know i think Shiguru is not using this word lightly um i think portrait alludes to art alludes to you know the fact that before you actually learn what the portrait is, um, you are probably thinking it's a painting or some kind of maybe digital photography, image, something, caricature, whatever it is, but that it's an art piece, right? So um, I want to ask everyone in the class today um, what you think the portrait the word itself or the concept represents in the novel and how do you think the key characters understand it so this is a two-part question what is the portrait why is it a portrait why is Ishiguro using that word and also then secondly how do characters in the novel understand the portrait how does Clara understand it how does Mr Capaldi understand his creation what about Josie's parents those would be the key um, players who contemplate the concept of the portrait Okay, and you're welcome to respond. <laughs> Not all at once. I know most of you got that far in the novel because we talked about it last week or the week before, sorry. <clears throat> so, um, oh, you're busy typing. Okay, cool. <laughs> Good. Uh, Tegan, okay. As an artist, uh, portraits are meant not just to be an illustration of someone's appearance, but their personality and character as well, uh, which is why you believe portrait is the word used since the portrait was made to be a copy of Josie in every sense of the word. I didn't think about it that way. 
a portrait meant to capture the essence of somebody. Um, and this is very much like the concept pre-photography, right? Like if you're rich enough to have your portrait painted to hang in your whatever dining room or living room or whatever in your castle, um, it was it was meant to, yeah, capture who you were as an individual. So I very much agree with that um, assessment. And I think then um, we... I can't assume you read never let me go but it's the same assumption that uh ishiguro is playing with in his previous novel where the clones i told you i kind of briefly summarized it for you um the clones are asked to create art in order to what i mean they believe in order to express um their innermost being like to actually prove that they have a soul right so um there are debates, for example, Catherine Malibu's uh, book, Morphing Intelligence, uh, talks about, I've mentioned it before, it talks about the fact that some people refuse to see art created by AI as real art because they feel like to create art, you have to have some kind of human, for the lack of better word, soul, right? Whereas some believe that, no, that's... Um, that's too narrow and we're very anthropocentric we believe humans are more special than all other species that's what anthropocentrism basically means and so therefore you know if we really start allowing um ai to dabble in art and to create art in a way that is unexpected that's where the creativity and higher intelligence or perhaps higher whatever it is that we believe we have will be expressed so i i really um i like that answer very much and tegan adds yes portraits such as picasso's self-portraits are a great example of how portraits are more based on what the artist thinks about of the subject rather than their appearance okay that's another really great comment but a bit of a tangent because don't let me run on tangents tonight i'd like to also hear your presentations um yeah so not just um essence but the perception of that essence and all its idiosyncrasies that are so hard to capture um absolutely no 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 please that was awesome don't apologize for awesome comments okay others though the second part of the question is what do you think clara thinks about the portrait or the rest of the characters who know about it Someone who decided to call themselves administrator. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, captures person's best version of themselves. Yeah, it's true. If you look at like photographs of people, you know, maybe in the earliest days of photography and then their portraits, there seems to be a discrepancy. Everybody wants to be painted more beautiful or perfect than they are. Um, <laughs> so, um, Oh, Aaron. Okay. No problem. Cool, Aaron. Um, okay. So the portrait could be actually an improvement, at least to some extent in the mind of people who are creating it uh, on, upon the real version. That's a good theme to explore too. Can, jo uh, can Josie be even better if she's replicated by Clara? I mean, if you read in like till the end of the novel, Clara doesn't believe she can even manage a perfect copy never mind an improvement whatever that means right sorry guys for my voice i'm still sick um okay any other comments all right you're also welcome to comment if you wish um yeah i i guess i i had uh two two questions and and maybe a comment um uh, uh tanya yeah. The, the the book that you referenced, uh, Morphing Intelligence. Yes. Um, what about uh, like um, what about pieces of art that are painted by animals, right? Like elephants or or, or chimpanzees. Yeah. Would those be considered art? It's a similar debate, but because um, animals are from i guess that still same quasi anthropocentric 
quasi-anthropocentric uh, perspective, um, we, we kind of, especially if, if we believe in evolution and so on, I think we feel closer to the animal kingdom than to the artificial intelligence kingdom on a visceral level. So I think a lot of people um, perceive, yeah, I've seen some recent paintings. There was a pig that paints that... Right. It's just so amazing. Um, but some people say, oh, animal cruelty, you know, like there's a debate about that. Right. Um, I think um, we are deeply uncomfortable about other species doing something that we think is so unique to the human right. condition, right? But, but it may be that animals have some kind of a subjectivity, if not exactly a, a, a soul, right? Sure. Mm -hmm. right. Okay, and then I guess the other question is if the uh, for 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 Kant mm -hmm. is the is the capacity to care for someone or something the mm -hmm. same as the capacity for morality, right? In other words, I can care for uh, my my child, for example, and animals can care for their child, mm -hmm. but that may not be to so to care for the other is one thing, but to believe in a kind of an abstract social good. Mm -hmm. is a very different thing, right? Most mm -hmm. animals don't necessarily see, at least they don't seem to display that, whereas mm -hmm. they do seem to display mm -hmm. care for the, you know, when 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 your cat has kittens, right? It, it cares for them, right? Yeah. Yeah. So that's, I get, so that's that's my other question is 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 to to to, to is for Clara to love Josie and to care for Josie related to Clara's capacity to see to, to invest in uh, the good and a, a more abstract good. Right. No, that's, uh, yeah, I, I can't comment on it thoroughly because I'm so sad I didn't read the article I found just this morning uh, from just like, re just very recent. And um, I think the guy's uh, in Sweden or something. Anyway, this philosopher is actually reading Clara and the Sun for that sense of morality versus just pure animal desire to care. Um, okay. And yeah, and so um, I'm going to follow up on that and I, I'd love to actually, yeah, respond okay. better to this. Um, but, uh, and my computer crashed, so I don't even have it open because I found it accidentally because I was like, searching for plagiarism and students that, that's a, that but that's exactly where i was heading right yeah, because yeah. it seems to me that clara yeah. is horrified by the portrait yes but it's because she cares for josie as josie and she she's putting her care for josie yeah. above what might be a, a more abstract social good right it's right the old you know the old uh, uh switch car dilemma right do you save one person or do you yes. sacrifice one person for a greater good? Right. right? And um, I think that's one of the more questions Ishiguro is raising is, and, and it's related to your, your questions about art and aesthetics, right? But it seems to me, oh, this is horrible. It's horrible what they're doing. And it's horrible because I love Josie as Josie, if that makes sense. It totally makes sense. And um, again, uh... I think that you're absolutely right if you like closely read the end of the novel that Clara is aghast at this notion, like she's uncomfortable at least with the notion that um, they would even conceive of trying to replace Josie instead of trying to save her by all means possible. Um, but when she first finds out about Chrissy's plan and Mr. Capaldi's plan, she agrees. And that bothered me a lot, And right? right? Because I thought, wait a minute, hold on. This is supposed to be the person you care about the most. But you're like, yeah, sure. If she kicks the bucket, I'll, I'll be her. I'll play her, right. you know. Um, but um, this also, and I don't want to lose that thread of thought, but I'll, I'll, I'll give us a little break and I'll try to find the article to actually show you this really interesting bit of analysis that I'm not ready to comment upon. Maybe somebody else will. Um, but one of the things that I discovered accidentally because I was thinking about the final thoughts on the novel and how, you know, I mean, most people would read it as science fiction, um, but the book is actually, uh, you know, for shelving purposes. Um, so in, in um, the uh, publication information, where is it? Where is it? Subjects, science fiction, love stories. 
I don't know if you see, do you see the screen? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that it's um, actually categorized as a love story. And that makes me, you know, first of all, flashback to James Gunn's point um, in the article we read in the very first week of class, uh, where James Gunn says that science fiction is a bit of a super genre because it could be a science fiction love story, it could be a science fiction horror story, it could be a science fiction whatever, a historical piece, etc. Right. Um, but the fact that it's like even just that for me as total like nerd of publication categorizations, if that makes sense, that like people think of this story as a love story. So then I want to go into that a little bit today, and maybe some of your presentations will reflect upon that. But basically, you know, what kind of love do we get to um, experience um, in this novel? And what does it say about um, our capacity for love? Like, what is love, I think, is what one of the uh, key questions in the novel, even though it seems a little bit more subtle than some of the obvious themes of you know ai taking over a lot of jobs you know obsolescence of human labor and um genetic modification you know these things that obviously jump out at you as problems in the novel so and i really want to leave enough time for our presentations although on tuesday I only had four so i'm hoping we're gonna have more today but maybe not uh we'll see uh, I certainly have enough stuff for us to talk about if you guys are going to submit your presentations and recording, but I encourage you to present live. Um, Karamvir says, um, although she understood human emotions, it was quite surprising to see her admitting to act as Joe's right to, to want to act like Josie in case Josie doesn't survive right so i did have a second discussion question which we're not really going to address yet because i think we could do it through other means but um as uh professor redding pointed out the genuine desire to help in every situation in clara's case um is uh contrasted by um the scene when she goes to see the sun the second time and she apologizes to the sun because she had this revelation that the Cootings machine, there are more than one, and that, you know, she feels like she failed her promise to the sun. So she talks to the sun again. And in that conversation, it's really complicated because unlike the first conversation um, where she just you know, sort of tries to say everything she wants to say about Josie to the sun. And the second one, she has all these flashbacks. There are all these weird flashbacks to key moments in previous um, uh, interactions with the most important people uh, uh, for Clara. Um, she flashes back to the interaction meeting. She flashes back to conversations with Mr. Paul and with the mom and Josie and Rick and, and so on. Um, it seems like she's a lot more troubled um, in this, you know, in these final um, parts of the book. And she actually openly doubts her ability to recreate Josie. I'm going to pull up the passage while you guys are discussing the next part. Uh, I'll find it. Um, sorry, my computer crashed. So um, do you think Ishiguro sees Mr. Capaldi's project as hopeless, like the recreation of the human completely and uh, faithfully, um, we can talk about that, but that's, that's just another way of approaching it. Like, is Ishiguro giving us a lot of, um, hope for what AI can be, but at the same time with a big, big asterisk, believing that there's still something really unique and special, um, about every individual, right? I don't have to look it up. I put it in a PowerPoint slide. Uh, can I have a volunteer to read this passage, please? This uh, quote from part five, please, because I'm hearing myself a lot today. I don't like it. Sure. Would you like me to read it? Please, Owen. Thank you. Okay. So it's just, uh, okay, there. Please then consider Josie and Rick. They're still very young. Should Josie pass away now, they'll be treated, uh, they'll be parted forever. If only you could give her special nourishment, as I saw you do for Beggar Man and his dog, then Josie and Rick could go together into their adult lives just as they wish for their, wished for in their kind picture. I might, I can myself vouch that their love is strong and lasting, just like that of Coffee Cup Lady and Raincoat Man. 
Thank you, Owen. Awesome. Okay, so this is one of my favorite passages from the novel because I think there's so much packed into here. Um, like, I think Ishiguro is in overdrive with, like, saying what he wants to say in this book. At least that's the way I see it. Now, what do you think he's saying here is one of my very kind of broad questions for you. And secondly, um, uh, do you think that Clara's words here are being clearly contrasted with what we heard Mr. Paul, as well as Mr. Capaldi say about the human heart in a poetic sense? Sorry again, loaded question, but it is the last lecture. I can't help myself. Also, if you didn't finish the novel, I'm sorry for the spoilers, but you should have finished it. <laughs> um, so we remember Beggar Man and his dog. There's, you know, probably most of the kind of readers that we are today. We don't believe that the son actually resurrected Beggar Man and his dog. We think that she just misinterpreted. Um, she saw them sleeping and thought they were dead. And then next day they're alive and she thinks, oh, the sun, right? But at the same time, that's not set in stone. The novel asks you, what do you believe? You know, is it possible? Is resurrection possible? Um, you know, there are Christian themes throughout. Won't go there. Um, so, I mean, in this appeal, she's basically apologizing that she didn't do everything she thought she could do to reduce pollution on earth but she is begging the son to still heal josie because she believes that the son cares genuinely about true love and she interviews rick just before this conversation with the son and she says can you tell me you know the love between you is it true and he affirms that it is right um so you know what do you think is happening in this passage there's also this part we haven't discussed their game of drawing and commenting and i'm fascinated by it i think it's one of the cool parts in the novel um so again not all at once come on guys just share your thoughts could just be anything you're thinking it doesn't have to be perfect oh when <laughs> you read the passage what do you think so, sorry do you want what do i think of this quotation here uh -huh. um I think, if anything, it shows that she does have a soul. Like, if you think about it, how could an AI um, so, you know, clearly want to help some, uh, uh, you know? Mm -hmm. Like, how could how could an AI so clearly wish for these things? Mm -hmm. um, like, it, it does show that they do have emotion. It does show she has emotion or intelligence of some sort, obviously. And that she does have her own thoughts. Like, we've seen it throughout the entire book about how she comes to her own conclusions and makes her own thoughts. While she's not totally and perfectly human in some aspects, I do believe she does, you know, mm -hmm. does feel this, she does share some sort of feeling um, with humans, I guess. And with this passage, it, it more or less truly does show both her emotion and that she does have her own thoughts and feelings yeah. and that, she does um i don't know she, i don't know how to express it into words like no no i think if we, if i may just help out a little bit this connects to what uh, professor redding was saying about um the difference between um as much as i'm a total animal lover as you guys know i've got dogs cats <laughs> all over the house um but for Kant, just, you know, the cat caring for its kittens does not mean that the cat understands morality and that the cat would sacrifice its life um, for, like, 
a human or something you know what i mean although again when art you were saying this i was thinking about dolphins and i think there are a lot of studies that suggest that dolphins have some kind of moral fiber understanding um that uh we never really accounted for until you know the most recent kind of uh sophisticated studies of their behavior yeah there are also ongoing cases to determine whether uh animals have legal rights in court right whether they whether they constitute a person uh in the eyes of the the, the law uh, and those those debates have been quite interesting too because they may or may not be connected to their capacity for um uh, uh, for for subjectivity right right uh, and it may be that it, if, if you know what is it that defines a person is it just that you can suffer uh, as well right which yeah that's that's the one an animals certainly can do right yes all animals can suffer i mean i think even plants can suffer that's where i lose all the vegans uh, sometimes in these debates yeah. You know, because um, you can definitely tell when a plant is suffering. And I, I'm not saying it has a conscious way of suffering, but it's still suffering. Um, so even if you're vegan, it's not like you're completely um, free of uh, responsibility to world, towards That's right. yeah. the world, right? Or the universe. So then, yeah, as, as Owen said, you know, this passage actually kind of makes us feel like Clara has something like a soul, you know, soul is a very slippery word, um, you know, because in an old fashioned kind of sense, uh, people think of something that slips out of the body once the body is dead and then it goes somewhere. That's not, you know, we already looked at this with data in measure of a man. Um, data says something about replicating him um, that's very relevant to what I think Clara arrives at as you said Owen she comes up with her own conclusions that were never programmed or given to her they were not taught to her um she basically looks at every piece of evidence about what she knows about Josie what Mr Capaldi tested her on what Chrissy made her do etc etc all the things she learned from Rick and you know like she she's obviously incredibly intelligent and knows how to learn but the conclusion she comes up with um I think is similar to data's in measure of a man where data says I refuse to be disassembled by scientist named Maddox uh, because even if you take all my memories and put them into a positronic brain external to me and then you take me apart and you figure out how to build another one of me when you take my memories back put it back into me um, you might lose he says the essence right like it, some philosophers calls, call this the aura um, you know uh, every object, if you think about it, has its own unique co composition. And this notebook, you know, there are many of them made by Seneca College. This was a gift at a, to like I, I, I went I presented at a conference and they gave me this book. But every little stain and every little note that I made in here, that is hard to replicate. And Capaldi says, no, if I did all the diagnostics of every stain and I, you know, I, I knew I had a database of like every single thing that happened to this notebook from the day that it touched your hands, your human hands, you know, my, my sweat, my, my DNA on it, etc., that this could be replicated. I think both Data and Clara agree that no, um, there's something that will be lost. Uh, there's this fancy word called gestalt. It's like, it means the sum of all the parts is bigger and is not expressible by just taking all the parts and putting them back together. Okay. So I think that that's what this passage is really giving us. I think that um, you're right, Owen, that it's, it's a kind of vote for the possibility that AI can have not just subjectivity in the sense of being able to make, you know, good decisions, rational decisions, whatever, decisions that uh, adhere to our understanding of an individual. It's that um, Clara starts to believe in something more, and she seeks these answers through her weird kind of pagan worshiping of the sun, if that makes sense. Um, 
Tegan says the smell of freshly cut grass is indeed the grass emitting signals of pain. <laughs> it smells so good though. Wow. <laughs> okay, <laughs> good comment. <clears throat> All right. So um, any final thoughts on this or anything else we brought up? I do have so many other things I want to ask, but we have to keep time in mind. And um, before we begin the presentation, I'm going to give you a quick break if you need to run to the bathroom or grab a water. Um, I'll keep the presentation rubric on the screen. Um, and I did give you like a sample uh, presentation to give you a sense of what I'm looking for. You've seen this since last week. Um, and um, basically, I will be jotting down notes on all the presentations as you're going along. Uh, the most interesting part to me, other than, you know, clearly stating what you think, you know, your main idea is and how you want to explore it through the topic that you've chosen, um, is the um, question. Excuse me. So the presentation ended with a discussion question that engaged the class. It's worth only two marks, but for me, it's like it's your way to get your audience, your classmates, you know, your your other intelligent beings in the class to encounter your idea in their own way. So you might learn something new from asking the question. Right. So that's where I'm um, very interested in uh, how you will phrase your question um also recall i said five to seven minutes is enough if we don't have that many presentations going you can go up to 10 minutes um but i will signal at 10 minutes that technically you should be wrapping up and unless we have like a super fascinated discussion and then i'm just gonna let it happen so i'll try to moderate as best as i can um but uh it's 5 16 can we reconvene at 5 20 so you can have a quick break Thank you. Awesome work. Thank you. Okay, so uh, uh, 520, we'll be back. Uh, I'm just going to mute myself for a second. I heard my kids are back from summer camp. I'm just going to say hi quickly. Okay. Um, and then yeah, so um, can you put into chat if you want to go first, second, you know, whoever's prepared today, uh, just you can direct message me or whatever, but let me know who is ready to present today. Okay, please. And thank you. Okay, see you at 520.
Okay, so I hope you guys are back. We'll wait just a couple of seconds um, to set up. I'd like to ask you if you want to share screen, if you do. So we've got uh, Sanju first. Do you want me to make you co-host Sanju so that you can share your screen or do you want to just speak and not bother with the screen? It's up to you. Uh, would it be right if I just speak? Yep, absolutely. Okay, perfect. All right. And so I've got my little companion here <laughs> <laughs> to keep us company. All right, go for it. Okay. Uh, hello, my name is Sanju Chigani, and my presentation will be on essay topic number two, which is both Clara and the Sun and Flowers for Algernon speculates about the possibility of enhancing IQ through surgical means argue for or against IQ enhancement based on two research sources. I found that real-world surgery that increases IQ exists and their benefits far outweigh their possible shortcomings. I argue for IQ enhancement surgery as real-world procedures and results show that individuals with degenerative brain disorders greatly benefit from IQ increasing brain surgery, which not only cure their disorders, but also significantly increase their IQ, which in turn also greatly improve their quality of life. According to Skiro of the National Library of Medicine, brain surgery such as temporal lobe resection, which is an example of real-world surgery, not only treats seizures, but also significantly increases the patient's IQ in the process. Skiro's work also cites the fact that individuals who underwent the IQ increasing surgery were reported to have a drastic increase in their quality of life. The selected text, Clara and the Sun, and Flowers for Algernon have cited that IQ-enhancing surgery can have negative effects, such as the de degeneration of physical health and the possibility of stunting emotional and social growth. I researched about the possibility, I'm sorry, I researched about the possibilities of degenerative side effects of IQ-enhancing surgery, but couldn't find any proof that IQ-enhancing surgery causes physical degeneration. However, I did find research regarding the possibility of social and emotional stunting. Karpinski of Science Direct argues that there is a risk factor for physiological and psychological overexcitabilities in people with high intelligence. Now, Kapinski, who argues that individuals with high IQ tend to experience overstimulation when exposed to emotional and social activities, which in turn causes them to develop uh, physiological and psychological issues such as anxiety and depression. In, in conclusion, although IQ enhancing surgery does have the possibility of developing physiological and psychological issues, they are minor compared to the amount of positive benefits IQ surgery has on an individual. I leave you with this question. Knowing both the possible physiological and psychological benefits and side effects of IQ enhancement, if given the opportunity, would you have a procedure done? Thank you. Thank you so much, Sanju. <clears throat> Great question. And also very pertinent, of course, to what we see in Clara and the Sun. Um, in particular, you made me think of the scene where Rick said something to Josie's mom, that Josie said, you should tell to my mom, maybe when I'm gone or when you feel the moment is right. And what uh, Rick says is that Josie not only does not judge her mom for uplifting her, but she says, I wouldn't have it any other way. This is what um, I believe my mom and dad both decided would be best for me and I don't question that for a second and it was out of love and you know so I mean I I cried when I read that scene to be honest I'm quite an emotional person but um Sanju brings up a very important question if we are already in the phase of having these kinds of modifications um 
being made possible, I mean, I think there are two very different situations. If there's a degenerative disorder, as you said, and it will, um, you know, the risk is worth the game, as they say, I guess, because, you know, if it's going to potentially really improve the quality of the person's life, that's different from you have no illness, but you want to be much smarter than you are. Um, so the, the novel asks us, is it worth it? Is it not? Right. So what do you guys think? Sanjo asked us a very, very good question. Would you get your brain altered tomorrow if someone offered it? <laughs> There's also socioeconomic issues. Can you afford it? Can you not? Create social inequality if possibly. That's, you know, that it's financially driven. My goodness, you guys are awesome. We have two more presenters. Excellent. Um, okay, come on. Thoughts? Art? Uh, probably. Probably. <laughs> yeah, I would. Yeah. Well, if you think about it, like, if if the chances are extremely low or yeah. whatever, then, of course, even with the risks involved, it could probably change your your outcome in life 100 and, or probably, like, 100%. Imagine all the tests you struggled and suffered with. You can breeze through or do them easier, or you can you can deal with problems more efficiently. Yeah. You can, and it in turn leads to a more prosperous and eventful life. I mean, there might be something to say for it if it removes some of your emotion or stops you from thinking a certain way, of course. Mm -hmm. But if there is no noticeable downside to it, I don't see why not, unless you're a body purist, but okay yeah no that's cool point too yep there are still humans on this planet who because of religious beliefs don't even want to yeah. get vaccinated or like, like it's the same I thing probably, yeah yeah it'd be the same thing with like bionic limbs like i think uh in 20 30 years time we'll actually see proper bionics come out but the question will be if they're only limited to you know people who have lost their limbs still or if they are limited to you know chop off your arm and get an uh, get a arm that can push 400 pounds easily like <laughs> it, that it, it's all like we'll, we'll have to see uh, yeah I, i'm also torn because there's a question on your makeup quiz for those of you especially who enrolled late and you get an opportunity to make up five percent of the course but I can't help myself. Um, remember Data asks in The Measure of a Man um, when Picard says, you know, like, why why do you think you should resist this scientist's experiment to disassemble you? Um, maybe we can make a lot of you, you know, we can have a whole race of Data and, you know, this will be really good because clearly you're like excellent and awesome and perfect in so many ways. and. Data says, so you know how Geordi has artificial eyes and they're actually much better than yours or any other officer or whatever lieutenant on this ship. Why isn't it mandatory to replace human eyes with artificial stronger, better eyes? Like, look, I mean, I'm wearing glasses because my eyes are not perfect. Um, and Picard goes, ah, mm, good point. <laughs> you know, why don't we just replace the whole bot? Like to some extent, that's where this kind of trajectory is going. Um, you know, if you can get rid of all the ailments, um, all the problems, all the diseases and illnesses that the human body experiences, but still keep the consciousness, uh, who wouldn't want that, right? So whether it's an arm that could push insane amounts of weight, or it's eyes that are so sharp that they can even see better than 2020 and, you know, have like cool perception, like, let's say we could program microscopes into our eyes and like perceive cool stuff that way um where's the limit and what's the point i mean i think we're back to i think you know what again i i kind of really feel like emmanuel khan gave us something important to think about you know where where do we draw the parameters of what we believe to be good for yeah the greater good you know and then there's another thing of like how much how human are you after you've done all this transformation right <laughs> like if i'm 95 percent cyborg and the 
just my brain is like, or maybe even I've replaced my brain. Am I still human? Right. I, I, and like, how would I be any different from an Android at that point? Like, let's say we have totally hundred percent machine, like built Androids like Clara. And mm-hmm. then I decide to hundred percent modify my body, like into a cyborg. How am I any different from Clara at that point? In that sense, is it just by how I think, or is it because I was originally a human? Right. So stories of origin, I'm going to stop myself and not let myself go on a tangent, but Frankenstein addressed yeah. that too. Origin. Yeah, exactly. Like what, does it matter where you came from or does it matter who you are at this point? Um, sorry, just quick, uh, Sandra. Yes. Um, yep. So guys, when you present, if you don't show the script on the screen, it's totally fine, but you're still, uh, obliged to, um, uh, submit your presentation script on blackboard under the assignments tab okay so um uh it's it's under assignments Sanjay. and yeah sorry about that are we also supposed to submit our essay with it as well the essay is like the expanded version the you know three to possibly 10 minute presentation is just in a nutshell what you explored okay but yeah. are we yeah. submitting both of them together with yep. the final presentation okay because I didn't see anywhere we were supposed to submit our second essay. I have might... <laughs> Okay. <laughs> I just, I wanted to clear my grading before you guys start bombarding me with more. When I see numbers explode with my marking, I get anxious. So uh, yeah, that's the reason. I'll open it tonight if you want to submit it tonight. I'd just like okay. to clarify. Yeah. Uh, so the presentation script, we have to upload it under the um, uploads assignment presentation script section. What about essay two? Where do we submit that? I will open the window tonight. I see. Okay. All right. So we don't have to uh, combine them. They're separate yeah. documents. They're separate. Yep. Gotcha. Thank you. Cool. You're very welcome. And thank you for our first awesome presentation. Uh, I am horrible at moderating time and not stopping myself from talking um so second is owen right owen are you ready yeah, no we're, yeah i i am ready um my thing's a bit off? shorter than, than okay. the last one though do um, you have a file you want to show or you're good just no I'll, I'll just speak it out here. here go ahead okay so i'll start in now hello my name is owen harnam and i decided to choose topic five to write my essay about as a researcher, or as a refresher, topic five asks students to construct their own topic based on Clara and the Sun. My topic being how Clara and the Sun is an accurate prediction of the future that we can expect to see in the coming decades. I chose to write about this topic because I found many similarities when, compa- when comparing Clara and the Sun's first world problems to our own. Supporting ideas were this. So the first similarity I noticed between the book and our daily lives were the monetary problems and divides in social standing. Uh, Clara and the Sun shows a clear divide in the social standing amongst its inhabitants based on wealth and positions of power and is, and is observable when making the comparison of lifestyle and worries between Josie and Rick, such as their wealth, housing, and future education. Um, for more specifically, you could see it in a quote that uh, Rick makes when talking with Josie about um, future education. He says that he has a theoretical chance at Atlas Brookings and that it has an intake of uplifts uplifteds as less than 2%. And that was page 129. Um, this, this quote is directly linking itself to um, how he was not uplifted as a, ch- as a child. So he is stunted versus the rest of the children his age. And this is because of his family wasn't well off like Josie's. Um, and then Comparing that to our own world and today's date, there's a lot of um, there's a lot of issues with money. Obviously, like uh, uh, students going through college nowadays are having tons of issues paying for their tuition or even having a chance to apply to college, even with with OSAP supporting you. Um, I do have a quote here. Um, yeah, in fact, according to Hoyas.com, which I did look up, roughly 22,000 ex-students had to file insolvency in 2018 to deal with their student debt. Um, so be it financial troubles or social standing, um, yeah, both, both issues are very similar in this sense. Uh, next, I did observe a change and, and how racism changes 
in Clara and the Sun in the come in the future. Mm -hmm. uh, Clara and the Sun expresses how racism will evolve and adapt in the distant future few through his characters. I found it evident when Clara was observing the newer B3 androids and how the B3s exchanged sly looks and signals whenever one of the older boy AFs took the trouble to explain something to them. That's a quote from page 36 that Clara observes. Mm -hmm. I then compared this to our world's growing trend of racism with supportive information gathered by Statistics Canada, which showed an 80% increase in the race of racially motivated crimes between 2019 and 2020, increasing from 884 to 1,594. And then finally, I touched on the crisis of a shrinking human workforce that is prevalent in both Clara and the Sun and our world today, which is mainly in due part thanks to the technological advances that are coming out in robotics. It's very easy to replace humans in basic skill level jobs, such as androids, which don't need any sleep, they don't need pay, and they don't need days off. And this has caused a lot of issues for workers in Clara and the Sun. It was readily observed in housekeeper Melania's attitude towards Clara, especially. As even Clara noticed and commented, Melania housekeeper was opposed from the start to my presence. Although I behaved towards her with consistent politeness, she never returned my smiles. And that was page 51. This is easily comparable to our world even, with automation speeding up around the globe as of recent, causing more and more unemployment. Browsing the web, I found contractbook.com elaborates on the crisis, predicting as many as 800 million global jobs and 475 million employees could be disrupted by automation before 2030. So in about eight years, even. Um, looking at the similarities between Clara and the Sun in our own world, I wouldn't be surprised if we were to see these changes in our own lifetime, especially like with global events such as the pandemic only adding fuel to the fire, um, especially regarding job elimination, it wouldn't be surprising to see taxi services soon become automated thanks to self-driving cars, which would become another lost job that we once fulfilled. Inflation also seems to be spiraling out of control as of recent, thanks to the Russian-Ukrainian war and especially the blowed gas prices, which have increased everything insurmountably. I remember when <laughs> milk was, you know, $4 and now it's seven, <laughs> like it's nuts. Mm -hmm. But yeah, after finding my own similarities between Claire and the sun in our world, I'd like to leave a discussion question to the class. Um, obviously everybody has already read the book here. So what other first world problems did you notice in Claire and the sun that were notable or comparable to the problems that we face as a society today? Like these could be anything from like mental health issues like how Josie needs an needs an Android. Um, nowadays we have therapists to help you out, or maybe something else like that. Awesome. Yeah, that was my discussion. Oh, and um, excellent question, guys. Jump on that. What other things? Because Owen did a great job pointing out some of the key concerns that the novel addresses. But yeah, mental health in particular could be explored in several several ways uh, through your questions. So what other first world problems to uh, repeat do we see in Clara and the Sun depicted that resonates with what we're experiencing already today? I mean, for me, loneliness, right? Um, we're so connected yet so distanced. You can reach anyone on this planet pretty much well if you have wi-fi um and they do too but i feel like i had better connections to humans 20 years ago yeah no especially like the internet has closed us off so much it's it's opened us up to everybody in the world but then it also feels like it's closed us entirely from what feels like real social interactions yeah. like you could remember um experiences in real life very clearly but then what anytime you're talking on the internet with somebody or having a discussion or whatnot it feels like those memories are almost faded much more than something you would experience in real life you know i that's how i look at it anyway i do and i agree very much um and Suyash so uh, didn't put this into common chat but direct message says inferiority complex yeah, um, with this idea of um, any kind of uplifting, whatever that means, um, Rick feels so inadequate because he knows that he's not lifted. Yet, I think the novel points to the fact that um, Rick is a lot more kind and socially adept than the rest of the kids, including Josie. Um, 
So I think that there's like a whole dissertation to be written on something about, you know, ways of undoing this um, feeling of inadequacy through, again, reconnection to ways of um, expressing yourself, um, not just rationally, intellectually, but emotionally, socially, um, Oh, and for me, loneliness expands to not just like personal loneliness, but um, lack of community. I've really felt that through COVID that some of the communities that I used to have just absolutely disappeared. Uh, something as silly as all the pools were closed and I swim a lot. And I didn't see all these people I used to swim with for two years. When we finally reconnected this summer, we're all like, I swear, people I never talked to, but it was just like, I know you you swim in this lane, I swim in this lane, you swim fast, you swim slow. Like I started meeting them. I met an 82 year old woman who's from Vietnam and left Vietnam during the war. And she was like, oh my God, how old are your kids now? Cause she saw me swimming pregnant like twice, you know, two pregnancies in the pool. And so I showed her pictures and she said her name is Kim. And she showed me her like eight grandchildren. Anyway, so I made new friendships because like, the sense of community was very destroyed during the pandemic. So you're right that the pandemic undermined a lot of um, community. Um, but at the same time, I think there's this desire for community, which we have. And there's hope for that, I think. And I think also Clara understands that to some extent in the novel. Yeah, I'd say the pandemic definitely brought back the feeling of needing, you know, personal and physical social interaction. Like when we were cooped up between March and like go, March, April, yeah. May, like at around that point, people were really starting to feel it, especially, you know, people who, uh, who are scared or their families were super hesitant about it and staying inside and being careful, right? Absolutely. And I think that as Ishiguro was finalizing his novel, perhaps... I don't know actually when the final draft was done, but there's something kind of prescient about the way he's predicting this loneliness, which by the way, we didn't read this work, but it's called The, T the Machine Stops. Uh, Forrester, you should definitely read this if you want to think about how somebody a hundred years ago predicted we're all going to stare into our screens and not have any human interaction. You should check that out. Thank you so much. I'm sorry. I'm going to stop blabbing and let the next presenter go. Um, I just can't help it. You guys are awesome. Uh, so now we've got Manic and then Muskin. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, Professor. Want, I would you present. like to share screen or no? Yeah, I would like to. Okay. I mean, just made you co-host. Go ahead. Awesome. Is it visible? Yes, absolutely. Go for it. Hello, my name is Monik. I'm going to present my presentation on the essay topic one, which is Darko Sovin's theory of cognitive estrangement as defining the characteristics of science fiction by contrasting the two texts, which I've taken like the nine billion names of God and the bone of man and woman. I argue that the cognitive estrangement can be used to show the world in a new perception. In the book Born of Man and Woman by Richard Matheson, the use of science fiction is very evident. Matheson narrates how a deformed child is abused by its violent parents. The parents do not allow him to interact with the other siblings or other people. Therefore, he chain it in the basement. Every time it's come out or is seen by the other children, the parents beat him up. The story ended at the moment when it knocks a stick off his father's hand, frightening him. It resolves that if it beaten and will turn, he will turn violent. It ran across a room and hung with its leg, showing the readers that it might be a deformed and more than they had presumed. For the supporting ideas, the Matheson uses science fiction to have character monsters in the real world would interact with the human beings. Cognitive estrangement is evident when the child falls out with the parents, the readers can presume pick up the elements such as abuse, mistreatment, and self-worth anger. In the book, Man and Woman, cognitive estrangement is very vital and, it, and its importance cannot be underrated. 
the first thing that happens in the real world are simulated in the reader's mind. Some aspects such as parents beating the poor deformed child may be very challenging and hard to practice in real world. The writer therefore uses science and fiction to show how injustices are committed against those who are weak. And talking about the nine billion names of God, which is written by Clark in 1953, it is basically a story of the monks who, who, who believe that the God created the universe for a reason. And if they could name all the names of the God, the universe would come to an end. To aid this, they started encoding all the possible names from the alphabet, though they figured out that to finish this, this would require them 15,000 years to do this, which was too long. They numbered more than 9 billion names, each with more than 9 characters. They hired computer experts to help them to decode the name faster. The Westerners who didn't believe knew that the monks would blame the computer if the universe did not end. Therefore, they delayed the process and scheduled the operation to end in the same period they would leave. The story ends terrifically. While waiting in the mountain for the plane to take them, they realized the stars were vanishing. The supporting idea in the nine billion names of God were the cognitive estrangement is very important. Mysticism, which is a huge part of this story, creates a perfection that impossible things can still be possible. The interdependence of religion and science is also portrayed in this story. The dependency of the church to science is evident in this story as well as in the present world. On the other hand, science does not solve and answer all the questions, therefore depends on religion and supernatural beings to give certain answer. In the nine billion names of God, cognitive estrangement is the most evident. Religion without science is blind. Therefore, the story, which mostly is religious, still shows the power of science in the complexion of tasks that could take a longer time. Predicting all the possible names of God would take 15,000 years. However, with the help of science, the name could be projected and the outcome made in public is less than three months. This narrates to the reader the power of science. On the other hand, the fiction is evident when the stars vanished at the same time the monks were supposed to be getting the last time. In the end of this presentation, I want to discuss, discuss that. Do you think more writers should cooperate cognitive estrangement in their stories to give readers different perceptions and comparison between different worlds? Cool. Thank you so much. Uh, that's a really cool question. Uh, I wish you left it up, but that's okay. I think we remember. So should writers incorporate- Should writers incorporate cognitive estrangement in their stories to give readers different perceptions and comparison between different worlds? Cool, awesome. So we did read Darko Suvin's essay on that and it was connected to Mimsy where the bar goes where um, children, it is a science fiction story and children learn new things from um toys from the future but um as may, many of you probably if you read the article um about Ishiguro's novel uh that talks about cognitive cognitive estrangement in Clara and the Sun uh you were made aware that for example Franz Kafka um who wrote stories that are not classified as science fiction really at all um but they demonstrated that kind of estrangement and there are other authors mentioned which I won't again no tangents but the point is you can use cognitive estrangement um outside of science fiction in order to allow the reader to perceive something differently um so um yeah so I have thoughts on that but great question should like this desire to perceive from um, more than one kind of ideological dogmatic perspective should that be really questioned in literature a lot more like does our literature still lack a certain amount of estrangement that is good for our psyche for our brain for our cognition emotion etc what do you guys think you could also give us examples of other stuff that could be estranging
like when I read Kafka's diaries in Russian, in my defense, because it's in translation anyway, and Russian is a strong uh, influence on me. Um, I thought it was incredibly estranging. Like Kafka, even in his diaries, wrote about human behaviors in a way where you feel like he looks at somebody, like the one example I will never forget, he noticed a female I think it was a colleague or something and she had a lot of powder caked on her face like especially around the creases of the nose and he was like why do females put so much like dust on their face do they think it looks good because it looks really fake and it's it just like it's almost like a lacking human convention um observation you know because obviously it's not like Kafka didn't know women use makeup but he was kind of like that's weird and he wrote about it in his diary um Ah, uh, Mida. Hey. <laughs> um, yeah, that's fine. Uh, I'm going to have wrap up classes next week. They're not going to be very long. And if you still really want to present um, live, yes, I did respond to your email today. Um, please um, just make sure you're organized and structured. You can also record it up to you. OK, so um, I think that the question was really good. Do you guys have any thoughts on estrangement or? Did I take up all the answer time again, selfishly? <laughs> Are there works you read that made you think differently about the world in a way you'll never forget? That's another way of questioning. Both Tuesday and Thursday, Amita, yeah. Okay, you know what, uh, Manic, that was an excellent question. We're going to let people contemplate it and move on to the next presentation, but um, I certainly have lots to say about it. I'll write some feedback on your essay um, as well in response to this. Uh, so next we've got um, Moskan. Moskan. Hi, Professor. Good evening. Good evening. Would you like me to make you co-host? Do you want to share a screen or just talk? Yeah, Professor. Sure. Okay. Oh, uh, did Manic leave? No. no, I'm present, Professor. Okay, uh, <laughs> so I made you co-host. Um, remove co-host permissions. There we go. It just last class, I had somebody who was co-host. They left and they made themselves host accidentally, and then we had to all come back. Uh, <laughs> let me see. Uh, ba -ba 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 -ba, where are you? Where's Moskin? I just lost you. Sorry, can can you speak up? Hi, Professor. Yeah, Professor. Okay, awesome. Hello. Okay, perfect. I'm making Moskin now co-host. Go ahead, share your screen. Please. Is that visible, Professor? Yep. Got it. Okay. Hi everyone, my name is Muskan and today I'm here in front of all of you to present the essay topic three, how technology has been used in society to harden our thought at risk. Well, I have also selected two helpful materials that are peer reviewed articles. Well, stylistic features, conversational implication of the poem, Jobber Worky by Lavish Carroll, for mature spans and contaminations in the Polish translation, of Chaburwaki. Um, well, Mimsi were the borough groups. The, the story starts with a time box machine that mistakenly travels to two different centuries, one to the 20th century and the other to the 12th century. Well, there are two characters noticeable in the story that are Ema and Scott that shows the process of neuron development after using the cue. Well, this The thesis statement for this is uh, based on the concept that the technology has the power to influence our mind and thoughts in the both positive and the negative ways. It depends upon how, how we are going to use this. It can generate neuron growth and can make our brain active. This technology has also been proven very good in our educational activities. And the supporting ideas are the advance, advancement of the technology in the future has not only influenced the people to build the time machines, but also produce educational toys, which will help the future generation to learn about the abstract mathematics. 
Second is the educational toys change the thought process by enhancing neuron growth among the children. This created a difference in thought and knowledge between the Scott and Emma, which appeared to be weird to his parents and doctors who did not experience the neuron growth. Well, the third, the story tries to depict the technological advancement that is going to take place in the upcoming future. And also it impact the on the past as well. Well, for the people living in the past, it was hard to believe that the single toy could change someone's thought process, and this left them amazed. Well, it can be concluded that technology has influenced. Well, in the conclusion, that's all. Uh, well, technology positively influenced the human brain and enhanced the growth of neurons. The thoughts process can actively activity of the brain are also altered by the technology that is the educational toys that were used in the story it boosts the brain to think about some complex and abstract ideas which were unusual for the people who are living in the 19th or the 20th century uh, so all is from my side so now let me end my presentation with a discussion question that how do games help our brain functions to improve certain skills, just like enhance visual perception, improve ability to switch the between tasks and better information understanding. So all it's from my side. So now it's time for the audience. So you have, you can give your points to view one by one. So it would be fun, I think. So thank you so much, Professor. That's awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Maskan. Um, yeah, I mean, in the context of what you're saying, Mimsy were the Borgoves um, explores this idea that educational toys can really change the way that we perceive, um, the way we perceive at large, but also the way we perceive how education can happen, and that education can happen through this kind of game playing that uh, children find not so cumbersome as some, you know, education can seem sometimes. Um, so then, yeah, it's a great question. How do uh, games and, you know, we haven't talked about Bruce Sterling's text, which I also assigned where he talks to video game designers. Do you think there are games uh, in particular, I suppose, in the context of the 21st century, um, video games, interactive video games that um, do something that's um, helpful to our brains? Um, Aha. Uh -huh. <laughs> Amita says games have, have been proven to help people improve their focusing abilities. Okay, yeah, yeah. There are games that claim that they improve concentration for sure. Uh, these are usually games that uh, engage your either language or math skills, right? Yeah. Um, or perception of space, stuff like that. For sure, I agree. It increases the cognitive abilities as well. Yeah, and again, we're not going to get into other discussions of how there are critics of video games who say that they create uh, more of a scattered brain, ADHD, that kind of stuff. I agree with you that there um, are ways in which gaming, uh, not even, you know, my classical understanding of video games from like, you know, 90s and Mario, but more, more interesting um, variations now in the 21st century that they engage the senses in a way that's um, quite uh, enhancing of, of, of the experience of what a game could be. Like, for example, for my son's birthday, I bought him uh, the latest Kirby game, and it's called like something like Superstars or something. Uh, the point is, it's so creative that you can put on these costumes as the character and for example if you put the costume of a painter on the character can paint stuff against the enemies and the art creates some kind of interesting effect like it's it's totally sometimes surprising unexpected like it teaches you about this like different perception you know it, it, it's totally cognitively estranging as far as I see it um the other thing is there's uh James uh, no Jane McGonagall is her name uh I think the article is called how video games can say can save the world look it up uh I think she's a bit of a blowhard but 
like I think the article doesn't hold up too much to scrutiny, but there are arguments being made by some scholars. Like she's a video game designer, so obviously she likes to promote her industry. But um, there's an article from a couple of years ago, maybe four years ago, that uh, claims that video games can help to save our world. So if you're into that kind of stuff, check it out, Google it. Amazing presentation and question. Thank you so much. Uh, we're moving on. Um, let me see. Now we've got uh, Karamvir and then Ron. Okay. Karamvir, do you want me to make you co-host? Yes, ma'am. Okay, perfect. Let me undo Muscan's privileges. Okay. And Karamvir. <clears throat> Uh, excuse me, professor. Yeah. Sorry to disturb. Like I have a, like one exam today, so like if I can leave the class as possible. You so, presented. Like, you're free to go. <laughs> thank you so much, professor. Thank you you're so welcome. much. Good luck on the exam. Yeah, you're welcome. Bye. Bye. Okay. Karamgir is sharing. Perfect. Yeah, we see it. Oh, you recorded it, right. Uh, we can't hear the sound. I need you to enable your sound sharing. Uh, you know where you do it? Uh, at the bottom, when you click on... Um, just a sec. Uh, shoot, I forgot. Use and peer-reviewed articles. Um, Sorry. I will, um, I will argue about how the human condition is explored in various relationships through the characters. Okay, so like uh, um, my thesis will be focusing on how Clara and the Sun explores the human condition through relationships in its characters. And one of those supporting ideas is through uh, the mother, uh, where I like, well, I'll discuss about uh, her relationship and how it's like focusing through, what do you call it? through um her relationship focuses on like the death of her daughter uh and the future of her daughter uh and how like the human condition is uh the relationship they have mm -hmm. uh yeah so because like she's already lost her daughter and she's afraid of losing her another daughter and it kicks off a plot point where she's using clara as a means to replace josie in the event of her right. death uh there's yes so may i continue again absolutely uh, uh, so another point i'd be bringing up is uh, another relationship would be uh josie and her relationships with uh rick and how they're essentially like they have a rom somewhat romantic relationship mm -hmm. and they and they also have like the sh same aspirations of like being together and wanting to like just like be with one another, but there's a divided them in like how he's unlifted and in poverty while she's not. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then uh, the last sort of I'm trying to tackle is through the character of Clara and her relationships with the cast. So um, one of the relationships she has is with uh, Melania and how even though like she has an animosity and sort of like disdain for her for being uh an af they still ultimately have the same yeah. sort of goal in wanting to help take care and support of josie uh and another relationship clara has is with the son where in contrast to with most of the relationships throughout the novel where it's like between one individual and another uh this relationship is more like sort of a belief in like Religious, somewhat religious in feeling. Right. Okay, so that's all. That's all, and I'll leave with one last question: Is how will the relationships between us and others change and evolve through technological development over the years? Oh, excellent! That's a really good question. Exactly. So, how, based on what Ron has described about um, 
the human condition being explored through different relationships in the novel and um, the ideas of fear of being replaced in particular, um, fear of being divided because of technological advancements which lead to social injustice as with Rick and Josie, for example. Um, how do our relationships get impacted by technology, do you think, in the 21st century in relation to what I think uh, Ishiguro wants us to explore, right? Through the, through the kind yeah. of models of relationships that we see in the novel. Excellent question. Um, what do you guys think? Has anyone been hurt in their relationships by technology? Yes, no, why, why not? Have you been enhanced by technology in your relationships? Well, I, I have actually. Okay, um, good. So like, yeah, because like, um, usually I'm not that much social, like, like back in, like, even before the pandemic, I was always like, that person in the corner but like with the technology i've been able to like connect with other people online mm -hmm. and just like have some chat converse uh it's like be a bit more open to other people without having to like travel right so online communities i think that yes um for example i mentioned uh, jane mcgonigal's art, um, article that is called how video games can save the world she talks about that that sense of community i think one of the key examples she gives is world of warcraft where um the number of players that have played this game since its invention and the hours that they played is I forget millions i forget of hours it's it's insane it's really really powerful stuff because some people really you know build true friendships through this platform and i think that there's absolutely nothing wrong with it um for me you know there are questionable aspects online um i'll never forget the first time somebody showed me tinder um and i thought maybe i'm just really old-fashioned but i really on a gut level hate this idea of swiping through people to choose a date like as if it's like oh I don't like your nose oh you like this type of music ew oh you know you're a lot like me you know so this narcissism through things like tinder it just it makes me feel really icky um that would be my example of where I think technology can really ruin the way people used to actually meet each other and fall in love. Um, yeah, so I think people get hurt on Tinder, just going on record. Mm. <laughs> but your point about communities online, Ron, I agree. I think um, mm. I have one, it's through yoga. I teach yoga and I practice yoga and I have people I never met from other places in the world with whom I will interact because they practice yoga and we share that common activity hobby belief faith if you want you know mm. yeah so uh, i think this was an excellent question to ask like i really mm. think we should continue to ask ourselves where technology makes us stronger socially and where it hurts us and the places where it hurts us we should be like nah i'm not doing that you know enhance the stuff that makes you feel um good that improves your life that enhances your abilities and your um contribution to the world right so thank you that was awesome thank you thank you so much okay all right, uh i um, yeah. i gotta like, go now go that's okay i'll see you next week thank you all right see you people are dropping off <laughs> because we're over time uh do i have one more yeah uh Sharmin Kumar wanted to go? Uh, yes. Hello? Yes, and D DT? Uh, yeah, I was actually, I texted after Ron, but I think I texted someone in direct messages. I, I accidentally didn't send it to everyone. So he can go first, but can I go after him? Yeah, you guys, you choose. It's up to you. Um, Sharmin okay. Kumar, did you want to go or do you want to let DT go? It's up to you. I'm okay with anything. <laughs> okay. okay all right I'll go first sure let's do it uh do you want to be co-host or no uh no this should be fine okay cool yeah 
Uh, hi everyone, my name is Titi and I have prepared my presentation based on the essay topic that Ron did. What does Lara and Sun teach us about our human condition? Uh, every one of us would agree that human tendency is to think that logic and reasoning are the foundations of our behavior, which makes it difficult for us to reject scientific facts. However, in Clara and the Sun, Josie's parents are compelled to reject the fact that Josie can be replaced by Clara, which was a scientifically supported idea. So this demonstrates that there is something beyond science about the human condition that cannot be proven or seen, but only felt. So in the story, uh, Clara has a tendency to imitate human expression and mimic human emotions. She's like Alexa and Hans to Max. Uh, according to the article, Through New Eyes, there are software that can identify small variations in human expressions, but it has yet to produce computers that can replicate human emotions. So for the time being, Clara is an imaginary character because she doesn't have feelings that can be stimulated. Although as a young robot, she has to break it down before she understands, she still experiences pathos. Like for example, there was a scene where she saw an elderly man on the other side of the road and he's waving to an elderly woman and they freeze and they hug. And that was a very obvious thing that they were meeting after a long time, but Clara was not clear about that. She was very ambiguous about the expressions and she couldn't tell even if they were happy or sad. So I think it takes time for her to stimulate her emotions. Mm -hmm. And moreover, the morals of AI and its perspective on mankind are not as good as initially anticipated. Like when it comes to morality, the effective computer version of Clara's nature is her optical responses to right and wrong. Like while she'll follow your orders if they're reasonable and given in a respectful manner, she's far from a coward and she has a strong sense of right and wrong. So she can go with her optical senses. So I think the purpose of Clara and Son is not to be weird or enchanting or like magical, but it's about what humans intend to do. Like it is this, universe that the novel has shown us of theirs is not at all different from ours. Like despite the fact that lifting has made the human body more cyborg and androids more anthropoid, like this has been going on for quite some time. And the most obvious example of that would be treating people differently based on their status. Like Rick was not uplifted and that took away a lot of important things from him. So we're left wondering like how things will turn out as we read the story like we can just say that consciousness whether human or artificial is very very limited mm -hmm. so lastly my question to you guys is what do you think will happen to us if we allow robots to be able to feel the beauty and pain of the world around them like will it be the same fantastic that brings us back to helen oloy a little bit as well right <laughs> yes Okay, awesome, DT. This is a beautiful presentation. So concise. You got so much in there so quickly. I'm impressed. Um, <laughs> really. So, like, yeah, imagine Clara is possible. And let's say, I mean, I have children. I wonder if I would choose to have an artificial friend for my children. But personally, this is the thing that I really connected to when. Uh, if you ask about, you know, if we allow robots to be feeling kind of creatures that could actually be companions, um, mm -hmm. my example would be, I would say, I think it could have an amazing impact, especially in the sense of when we lose loved ones. Um, because when I lost my grandmother, who was like a mother to me, and she was 92 when she died. So, you know, I spent uh, yeah. a long time with her and she's <laughs> long time with me but if I could have a Clara version of my grandma and mm -hmm. even though she wouldn't be perfect I would prefer that you know remember when like Capaldi says you know to Chrissy that you know Sal was a bere bereavement doll right like a doll that yes. helps grieve um I think that if I could have something as sophisticated as Clara uh in the form of my grandmother I, I can't tell you like how happy that idea <laughs> You know, so I think that there's like some real potential there. But at the same time, 
you know, yes, uh, there are problems. And for example, you know, other stories other than Clara and the Sun that we encountered, um, where you have something like an artificial friend, like Data uh, or Helen O'Loy, you see some limitations that make you wonder if maybe, you know, we can create something that could really cause some problems, pain, you know, certain forms of, um, human conflict that we don't anticipate so yeah but excellent question thank you for making me remember my grandma <laughs> <laughs> i'm glad i did thank you cool thank you so much awesome uh current view yeah essay deadline is the 16th if you need until like the day after that's okay but the grades are due i have to give your grades to the college by august 22nd so if you submit it anytime after the 17th it'll be really hard for me to mark um, on time and that gets into administrative problems. So please, if you can, 16th is like awesome or the next day. Okay, uh, uh, Charmin Kumar, you're next, please. Do you want to be co-host or no? Um, no, I'm good. Okay, cool, go for it. Uh, hello everyone, my name is Charmin Patel. Uh, I have prepared my presentation based on as a topic two, both Clara and the sun and flower for Algernon. Uh, speculates about the possibility of enhancing IQ through surgical means. Argue for or against IQ enhancement based on two research sources. Based on my thorough study on the SF Clara Anderson and Flower for Algernon, I argue that surgical IQ uh, augmentation is advantageous, safe, and is beneficial to humans. Flower for Algernon speculates how surgical means can be useful in helping humans to improve their intellectual intelligence by successfully experimenting on animals and human. As Keyes put in writing, how Charlie being the first human to undergo surgery had resulted in positive results of IQ enhancement. As stated by Keyes, a white mouse named Algernon was the first successful fully surgically experimented subject to improve the IQ. The results from this experiment were pragmatic. These trials motivated Charlie to undergo the same experiment and he became the first human ever to increase his intellectual intelligence by surgical means. This evidence of strengthening IQ through surgical means on humans back in the 1966 is enough to assert that surgical means are favorable and secure. Furthermore, the reports of Charlie after the trial showed increment in his IQ and way of focusing on different aspects of his life. This proved to be advantageous to him in many ways and helped him figure out things more maturely. Although the results he expected from this experiment to make new friends turned out to be the other way, the reason behind this was due to his enhanced adult thinking capability that he chooses to speak lesser with friends. Further, in the essay, I examine the different after-test reports of Charlie and study what kind of intellectual improvements are seen in him at distinct stages of this experiment. Although there are numerous other ways to increase IQ, including diet, exercise, meditation. These techniques take a lot of time and depend on uncontrollable outside factors. Therefore, using surgical methods to enhance one, one's cognitive capacities is more effective and quicker. I further put forward another SF, Clara and the Sun, to strengthen my argument. Josie undergoes surgery to enhance her IQ, IQ just like all other rich children, but the outcomes are unfavorable for her and she suffers from an unexpected illness. Sometimes the results we get is much worse than what we have expected, just like in case of Joseph. However, if we look on long-term basis, she gets back to normal and live an ordinary life. Clara being an extraordinary asset, AF uh, play a significant role in her life and helps her see the world in a different way. This is very unusual for an AF as they are not supposed to feel things like humans do. However, in Clara and the Sun, Clara not only understands emotions, but also show a way to Josie to overcome her illness and understand the world more deeply and differently. This shows how an AF can help helps improve the psychological abilities of humans and can be better companion than other, another human. At last, I would like to put forward two questions in front of you guys. Would you accept the opportunity if it ever presented itself to have surgery to raise your IQ? And the second one would be, what would you prefer as a companion if you were 
to choose between a human and an and an AF like Clara. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sherman. Ah, uh, those are really cool questions. The first one we kind of already explored through yeah. this presentation, uh -huh. but yeah. legitimately that's a good question to ask. So what about, yeah, uh, to wrap up um, our amazing time with Clara and the Sun, uh, what kind of companion would you choose if you had the choice right now in the 21st century and there was a possibility to have somebody like Clara and, you know, there would be a whole store with different types of AF so you could actually choose the one that you feel is for you. Would you choose that or would you choose still a human companion? Why? Etc. right? Um, I think it's a cool question to ask. You know, I already shared that, for example, I'd love to have. Yes, I, I just uh, <laughs> before this. Yeah. So, for example, would I want another friend who's human or would I really want to have my grandma as an AF? I have to say, I think I choose my grandma. She's like the best person I ever met in my life. Um, so here's my answer for you. What about you, Charmin? What do you think? I'd also go with an AF like of my kind, a particular type. Right. Uh, just like, yeah. Uh, just like how you say that we have to choose from a bunch of them. Yeah. Uh, and what suits me best. Yeah. So I think that there is a desire for a particular kind of companion that may be filled by AI. I think that mm -hmm. that's a fair um, comment to make based on the novel. Um, if there's anyone who would say, no, no, I still think that human con companionship would be more rewarding for me, I'd love for you to think why. Uh, and maybe we can share that in our final wrap up class next week. Oh, Sayash says I would choose a human companion because we know that they are no, not programmed to behave in a particular way. Um, yeah, except we talked a lot about programming through like stuff like psychoanalysis and how we like to think that we're so spontaneous, but a lot of our behaviors are pre-programmed by education, parents who taught us to do things in a certain way, uh, society, all the rules, laws, you know, etc. So we're not as unprogrammed as we like to think, just kind of suggesting that um, I think humans forget about all the training that we receive and that that training makes us have habitual repetitive behaviors that um, maybe are not the best. Um, you know, I'm thinking about um, ways in which we are not as sometimes kind as we'd like to be. Josie demonstrates that in some scenes of the novel. She's, I think, nicer than she presents herself sometimes, but there are times when she acts horribly. Um, and why is it, right? Because of some, some kind of uh, upbringing, education she received, uh, or lack of upbringing. I mean, her dad is gone uh, out of her life most of the time. She has these teachers on her oblong, you know, the screen, just like we are right here, you know, that you lose some, some human contact. And I think there are explanations for her behavior that Ishiguro gives us. Um, whereas Clara seems to be programmed to just be kind, you know, like there's really no downside to helping humans to be more kind. If we can figure out how to program that, I think that would be kind of a good thing. So again, the distinction between biological and artificial gets troubled in this novel. And I think that's one of the um, most interesting um, binaries that the novel presents for us to explore. Um, yeah, exactly, Suyash. It's not always clear, you know, where our behaviors come from and uh, how we can justify them sometimes. Humans act irrationally. Sometimes humans act in ways that are very harmful or self-harmful. And we need to continue to study that. So um, amazing class. We're two hours into this uh, class today. I did record it. I will post it if you ever want to rewatch it. Um, thank you so much, everybody. Who I'm so sorry. I was after Charmin. Oh my goodness, I missed you. All yeah. right. 
we're going to be way over two hours. Go ahead. Yeah, you can go. Can I start? I'm so yeah. sorry. Uh, no, don't be sorry. Do you want to share your screen? Or are you okay? Uh, no, I'm good. Thank you. Okay. Go for it. Yep. Last but not least, Nivedita. Thank well. you. Okay, uh, hello, everyone. My name is Nivedita. I have made my presentation on essay topic seven, which says that good science fiction is always unconventional or weird. I agree with Bruce Sterling's statement that a good science fiction work is often weird. To support my argument, I have researched on James Gunn's definition of science fiction as a literature of change and Darko Suin's cognitive estrangement theory. In my essay, I have discussed some of the great work of science fiction by Aldous Huxley, George Orwell, and an overview of Mirror Shades by Bruce Sterling. I argue that science fiction as a literature is supposed to be unconventional. As one of the well-known writers of this genre, James Gunn states in his article towards a definition of science fiction, and I quote, uh, my involvement with the definition may have begun with my original discovery of science fiction and my realization that this literature is different from every other kind. As, J as James Gunn says in his article that science fiction is a super genre that even though the genre is a sub genre of fiction, it can be of multiple types. You can have a science fiction love story, a horror, or even a science, science fiction fantasy, or a gothic science fiction as well. It can be said that science fiction does not have a typical action or place. Isn't this weird enough in itself that the genre of science fiction has no clear blueprint or a skeleton? Uh, Gunn further argues that to research the true meaning of science fiction, one must first eliminate the aspects that are not unique to this genre such as mystery, adventure, and other traditional fictional settings, which is left is change. What is left is change. Sometimes there is nothing left as we remove the elements and we realize that the work was not science fiction at all. To further support this, James, uh, James Gunn argues that uh, in a good science fiction, the characters are faced with a situation that is different from this familiar world and that they must respond to it in a different way or else they fail. Now in a new wave, science fiction or a science fiction that is not good or weird enough, there may be a situation, uh, there may be a situation which is different, but the characters respond to it in a traditional ways or ways that are not appropriate to cope with this situation and uh, they often fail. Uh, Gunn's argue does not have the right stuff to be a good science fiction. In a, a traditional fiction, the literature is continuous with everyday reality. But when, a, when the characters start to respond to this continuous situation in an untraditional way, it begins to feel like science fiction. To back my argument, I also explore Darko Suin's cognitive estrangement theory in his article Estrangement and cognition, Suin says that science fiction shares, shares with traditional fictional fictions such as fairy tales or uh, might fantasy. It differs very significantly in approach and social function. A work of science fiction usually include two things. First one is an extreme recreation of author's empirical environment. And the second one is a newness. Uh, it acts as a mirror to the real world places or characters in which the monsters or aliens are a reflection of people and a strange environment may be a mirror of the author's real world. This mirror, according to Suin, isn't only a reflecting one, but also a transforming one also. I would quote Suin where he says, science fiction takes from a fictional hypothesis and a developed it with significant rigor, which he refers to as estrangement. Suvin argues that science fiction makes us recognize the subject, which seems familiar, but is also the same time makes it seem unfamiliar too. The cognition part of Suvin's theory referred to the use of science as an explanation of the mythical or supernatural. 
it commits a creative suicide where science fiction does not use wish fulfilling element but empirical laws thus the science fiction can be based on something completely mythical such as fairy tale but explore it through the basis of science thus it is indeed strange as a genre where the estrangement from the real world to a fairy tale is explained through the cognitive aspect in my essay i have compared 1984 and brave new world which i have explored both through the perspective of suvin and gunn's definition both my uh, both may seem like a, a general utopian or dystopian story but as you go further the reader left with a question which is which i also explore mirror shades which is a collection of cyberpunk stories a perfect example of guns and suvin's definition at last i conclude my essay with a question that do you agree with the statement that a good science fiction story is a unconventional what science fiction story we have read in our class do you find most weird thank you professor awesome nivedita that's a great question to ask okay so what was the weirdest thing we read this semester <laughs> on those of you who are still hanging on here was clara and the sun the weirdest thing was it blood child not talking about the readings which we have read but i want to talk about the born of man and woman oh sure the strange thing which i found that uh, how parents can treat uh, their children like that mm -hmm. like putting him in the basement not interacting him with the other siblings his siblings or other children mm -hmm. that was quite confusing i don't think that in this real world the parents use practically use it this method um manik i so hope that you are right um i um i think i'm a little less optimistic about humanity i think that there have been severe cases of child neglect in human history uh also in our um recorded lecture on flowers for algernon i told you about ancient treatment of children with disabilities and that basically they were killed um because they were thought to be a burden um so what i like in your comment is that you're saying that born of man and woman shows us you know it's as uh, nivedita was saying darko suvin thinks that these stories give us a mirror to look into and understand our own behavior i think the cruel treatment of children or cruel treatment of anything that seems strange and other and foreign to us is really highlighted in that story and i agree it, it just it wasn't a story that i assigned to everybody you read it on your own um but if you guys want i mean it's the shortest story in the collection basically it's only a couple of pages like two and a half pages long read it and think you know is it really making you feel weird about um what a relationship between a parent and a child could be um yeah exactly the 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 really really cruel treatment stems from this like rejection right um i think i agree that that would be one of the weirdest stories in the entire um collection that we read um the science fiction hall of fame vol volume one any other thoughts I think a lot of students often find um, blood child to be quite weird. Um, and I remember I showed you the sketch. I forgot to say this when Art Redding was here, um, that I love when people put some artwork into their um, studies. So if anyone just for fun wants to draw Clara um, so that we can have that legacy from this uh, version of the science fiction course, please do. Um, even if you're not like a graphic artist or something, if you're, you're not really into art, but you want to make a sketch of Clara, I'd love to have a collection of your sketches. Um, totally just for fun. Um, but certainly, I mean, I'm planning to frame this and put it in my office. So um, yeah. So if, if you guys are artistically inclined at all next week, you could totally share your sketches of Clara if you want, or any other character from what we've read as well, of course. Um, yeah, that's fine. So yeah, for sure. 
Okay. So guys, thank you everybody. I'm going to let you go because we're definitely over time. Uh, thank you again for all your presentations. Can't wait to see you for the final class next week.